Entry point is finally done, so I thought it would be a good idea to look back and truly understand this world that Shadow has created for us. In anyone's first playthrough of Entry Point, there's sure to be a lot of things that are confusing about its story and characters, which is why I've linked my full timeline of the story in the description below. It details every event recorded in Entry Point history, so if you're interested in seeing a visualized version of this video, please feel free to check it out. Additionally, in my last lore video, a lot of people asked where I got my information from in the comments, which I'll explain now. For every mission at Entry Point, there is a hidden code that fits into the lock that can be found at the bottom of your XV bar in the main menu. These codes give access to all sorts of files, all of which I will be referencing throughout this video. You can see what file I'm referencing in the top left of the screen. So if you want to find these secret codes yourself, which is very hard to do, I advise doing so before watching this video. Otherwise, the codes can be found on the entry point wiki that has been linked below. Without further ado, let's get started. The oldest event in entry point history was the development of the K-45 by the Siegel Arms Company in 1945. A friend of mine told me that it was based off of the M1911, a real-life gun that was developed in 1911, much like how the K-45 was developed in 1945, which I think is a pretty cool reference. Next were the birthdays of the director, Jack Don Dimitri, born in 1955, 1967, and 1972 respectively. Of course, I'm obligated to remind you that this officially makes the director a boomer. The 480 MCS shotgun was developed in 1973, ready to destroy some public stealth runs. Then there came a whole load of birthdays. Harvey was born on November 7th, 1980. Ram was born on September 19th, 1981. Falcon was born on August 4th, 1984. Rivera was born on January 10th, 1985. Jade was born a month later on February 20th, 1985. And Rose was born on May 21st, 1986. Finally, on July 4th, 1987, Halcyon was formed in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada, by the Board of Directors. Here's where the fun begins. The Board of Directors consisted of different criminal masterminds, most of which we'll never really get to know, although the FBI so kindly offered a list of them here. Amanda Moss, Paul Nicotin, Vincent Chow, Daisuke Matsuda. Mm. Following my previous video on the mostly complete lore of entry points, some people started bullying how I pronounced Daisuke. Which I'll have you know, I purposely looked up on howtopronounce.com prior to the video's release, where they gave me the pronunciation Daisuke. I really didn't want to mess it up, so I asked my mom, who speaks Japanese, how to pronounce it, and she said it was pronounced Daisuke. So I'm going to say it like that now. Anyways, continuing. Kareen Eleven and Mason Wolf. So, on December 29th, as any brand new criminal organization would do, they assassinated a corporate executive in America to mess with the stock market a bit. Throughout the course of a few years, the criminal organization started growing taking part in operations worldwide by 1989. With all of these new criminal operations, surely the organization would need a weapon to help assassinate and heist banks, right? Introducing the CVRC. Developed exclusively in Canada in 1990, the CVRC can easily pierce armor and even complies with Canada's rifle laws. Buy it today for only $13,000. In 1991, Jack Daw joined the CIA, securing a background as an operative working under the government. After working there for a few years, he left the CIA and was recruited by Halcyon in 1994. While Jack Dow was busy working at Halcyon as a new operative, the youngest character in Entry Point was about to enter the scene, Sparrow. She was born on April 17, 1995. Shortly after, in 1997, the S-97 was developed by the Siegel Arms Company, marking part one of the Shadow War tryhards. In 1999, Ren started taking off in his career as a local sociopath. He got out of Baltimore and was classified by the local authorities as a missing person. He started working with a crew of professional thieves. A year later, in 2000, Dmitry emigrated from Russia to the US, working as a smuggler for a cartel. He was deeply in debt with the cartel for an unknown reason, which is likely why he chose to work with the freelance heist group to earn a way out of his debt with the cartel. It was around this time that he was formally evaluated by Halcyon as a potential operative but was ultimately denied due to his passive temperament and pacifist lifestyle. He literally refuses to carry or fire a gun under any circumstances. In 2001, Ren's crew of thieves worked together to conduct an infamous bank heist in Boston, giving the crew the common nickname the Boston Four. This bank heist was extremely well planned and showed Ren's capability as a future mission coordinator for Halcyon. The crew used two groups of robbers to steal the money without being caught, essentially using the first group as a smokescreen while they stole the money and escaped the bank disguised as SWAT. 
Harvey was also hired by the group occasionally as a contractor to scout out locations that the group would rob. The UP9 was developed the following year, in 2002, and apparently they were so common that Halcyon started handing them out to operatives for free. Well, that is, until recently. In 2004, a lot of interesting things happened. First, the death of one of the directors, former CIA agent Amanda Moss, was killed in an automobile accident. While it may have just seemed like an accident at the time, this quickly led to the deaths of the other directors in the coming years. It's around this time that Ren's crew, the Boston Four, was caught by the FBI, after Ren gave them an anonymous tip. Ren didn't really seem to care for the group, and he was willing to betray them at any point. Harvey, devastated by the betrayal of his comrade, started working alone. He grew a paranoia of working with the team. After Ren left his crew, he was hired by Halcyon, who took interest in his criminal capabilities, along with Rose, a self-taught hacker from a wealthy family in Monaco. Both of them were assigned to operative jackdaw for training. But more importantly, the CHA hunting rifle was developed along with the F-57, marking part two of the Shadow War tryhards. 2005 and 2006 weren't very eventful, with a few exceptions. On June 12, 2005, director Paul Nikitin died of a heart attack, leaving four directors in control of Halcyon. It was around this time that Jade also started taking contracts, developing a persona as a professional sniper. Halcyon also attempted to evaluate both Harvey and Jade around this time, but Harvey got denied, while they were unable to contact Jade following an operation with him. Harvey was denied due to his manipulative personality. I mean, he says he's a professional thief, but look at his Halcyon file. It says he's a social engineer, not a thief. He was also denied because he would have had trouble working with someone who betrayed him in the past, proving that Ren sold out the Boston Four. Jade was a different story. She was an incredibly successful sniper, with Halcyon noting that she had 16 confirmed kills, two of which were notable due to their high rank in a cartel. However, she didn't get paid for those kills, meaning they were likely due to personal reasons. Halcyon wanted to evaluate both of them by contracting them to work on an operation in Las Vegas. However, it didn't go so well. Jade mentioned in the setup that some group approached them about hitting a mark, referring to Halcyon's attempt to evaluate them in the field. Following that operation, Halcyon lost all contact with Jade, and were ultimately unable to get her to join the organization. This is also probably why Jade doesn't really like Harvey in the prelude cutscene. She still hasn't gotten over the fact that he messed up the operation somehow. That same year, the MM-20 was developed for use by the Chinese Special Operations Force, making it unavailable to the rest of the world, until a third-party supplier, Armora, sold it in the US. Following this event, in 2007, the third director of Halcyon, Vincent Zhao, was killed in a plane crash, leaving three directors in control of Halcyon's business and operations. Finally, the stage is set. All of the characters have reached where they are in 2007, and two separate stories are about to begin. The Freelance Heist expansion begins with the cutscene Prelude on April 16th, where we finally see the Freelancer and Harvey, ready to meet Jade and Dimitri in a warehouse, after having been blackmailed by the broker. Jade and Harvey recognize each other, mentioning a job in Vegas, which refers to their operation together in 2005. While the Freelance Heists were taking place, another major event in the EP timeline was about to happen, on the different side of the story. In the transcript Insurance, on May 5th, Mason Wolf, one of the three remaining directors, ordered Operative Jackdaw to kill the other two directors. By this point, Daisuke and Karina knew what was happening. The deaths of the other directors weren't coincidences. They were planned by Mason the whole time. They planned to meet at a park in Toronto called Trinity Bellwoods, and Mason ordered Operative Jackdaw to kill them, presumably through any means necessary. That same night, Jackdaw killed both of them in a drive-by, leaving Mason Wolf in full control of Halcyon. This gave him the name we know today, The Director. No one knew what he'd done, how he'd assassinated the other five directors to leave himself in full control. No one, that is, except for Jackdaw. He used Jackdaw as a tool to kill the remaining directors, and maybe even to kill the others as well. He had served his use, and now it was time for him to die. On May 29th, Jackdaw led his squad on an operation called Ember Shroud. The goal of the mission was to destroy a place called Bang Q Monolith, and eliminate Julian Morau, a money launderer for Halcyon, but there was a tertiary objective as well. The director personally told Jackdaw's squad, consisting of Ren and Rose, to kill Jackdaw. He informed them that Jackdaw had killed the other directors, and that he needed to be stopped. The mission was a resounding success, resulting in the death of both Julian and Jackdaw. In the debriefing script, the director seemed to show sentiment towards the loss of a fellow operative. Maybe he felt remorse for having used him in such a deadly way. Regardless, Ren was promoted to mission coordinator in Jackdaw's absence. A few days prior to the Ember Shroud mission, the Freelance Heist squad worked together in the mission The Setup. The goal was to infiltrate a shipment convoy for the broker. 
they tagged armored trucks, not knowing what was inside of them. In order to ultimately steal from the trucks, they required a weapon to take down the trucks and an untraceable helicopter to escape in. They contacted an arms dealer named The Armorer, the same person who helped distribute MM20s in the Western Hemisphere and created the Saw Blade. She was willing to provide weapons, but only if they helped her deal with a problem of her own. The Armorer's weapon shipments were being stopped by the police, so she asked the group to take them back as a favor for providing them weapons. The crew was successfully able to return the shipments to Armora, and prepared for the final mission. On July 1st, the cutscene Take occurred. In this cutscene, Harvey revealed to the group that the armored trucks were hauling $20 million in gold. He and Jade suggested taking the gold for themselves and betraying the broker. Dimitri and the freelancer agreed to this, and the freelancer showed signs of remorse, saying, Something like this, there's no going back. Regardless, the group prepared for their final mission on June 3rd, The Score. They successfully opened the armored trucks and stole all $20 million with the help of Jade and Dimitri. Canonically, this mission is done with a group of three or four people, as Harvey loves to point out by breaking the fourth wall. I agree, Harvey. Stop doing challenge runs. We get that you're good at entry points. By the way, this isn't a part of the story, but oh my god, ever since the reveal of Prelude, I've really wanted Jade to work as a sniper backup from a nearby building, and it happens! Let's go! A day later, in the cutscene Departure, the group returned to a warehouse, where they admired the profit they had just earned. Jade said that they needed to act quickly, before the broker found out about their betrayal, but Harvey responded by saying that the broker wasn't real. He and the freelancer shot Jade and Dimitri, taking the gold for themselves. The freelancer showed a lot of remorse for doing this, because they seemed attached to them, they became friends with them. Harvey exploited this and tried to shoot the freelancer to take the money for himself, but failed, and was knocked down by the freelancer. It's at this point in time where the timeline breaks in half. The player is given the choice to kill Harvey or spare him. Either way, the freelancer wouldn't get the money, as Harvey was the only person with a contact to fence it. If the freelancer killed Harvey, they left the scene earning nothing. This continued the cycle of betrayal and paranoia. Ren betrayed Harvey back in 2004, causing Harvey to have major paranoia about working with anyone else afterwards. Once Harvey betrayed the freelancer, the freelancer killed him, making them the new Harvey. This is best noticed when the freelancer says, I understand why Harvey betrayed me. It's who he was. It's the same person he made me. If the freelancer spared Harvey, they left the scene. They said, You're a con artist, Harvey. This is who you are, and that'll never change. But this isn't who I am. This broke the cycle, with the freelancer taking a different path than Harvey, deciding to work alone as a contractor. Harvey was incarcerated at USP Tucson, after pleading guilty to all of his crimes. He refused to identify the freelancer when he was asked to. Maybe it was out of respect for leaving him alive, or maybe it was to prevent the cycle from continuing by betraying them again. Regardless, no matter what option you picked, the freelancer left with one last lesson. Life is short. You never really know when you'll die, so it's best to make the most of it while you can. Harvey understood this, as he said in the cutscene take, steal what you can, I don't know when you have to, right? Finally, we reached the main game. Entry Point's story up to this point was immense. The history behind each character and their skills were all leading up to this moment. On January 27th, 2012, the Black Dawn cutscene happened. An anonymous client hired Halcyon to destroy a research lab in Phoenix, Arizona. Ren's squad, consisting of operatives Pathfinder, Updraft, and Rose, did destroy the facility, but only after taking intel from a computer and stealing the mysterious Project Onyx files, hiding it from the client. As they were making their escape from the facility, they were ambushed by Jackdaw, who exploded their van with a thumper and killed two operatives. He shot Rose twice and spared her, for an unknown reason, and left the scene with the secret files. The police arrived at the scene shortly after, arresting Rose and incarcerating her without trial at Wargate, a military prison led by a government organization called Steel Cove. Halcyon was pretty unhappy with the failure of the mission, and wanted to stay away from being investigated by the government. Unbeknownst to them, the FBI took interest in the operation and started to investigate Halcyon, following the stealing of the classified Project Onyx files. The police in Arizona had an evidence file on the Dawn Valley incident, but Halcyon didn't have any operatives in the area, so they decided to hire a contractor to steal the evidence. The Freelancer. After the Freelance heist, the Freelancer was out doing normal crimes, such as bank robberies and the like. It's interesting noting that besides the Freelance heists, and the special ribbon that they have, the Freelancer doesn't actually have a backstory. 
This was absolutely intentional. The developer of the game, Sashado, stated that they don't want to force a backstory on the freelancer, as it ruins the fun of creating your own operative with their own story in the EP universe. Regardless, the freelancer just finished a successful bank robbery when the newly promoted lead operations coordinator, Ren, contacted them. He wanted to steal the evidence file for the Dawn Valley mission from the police, and the freelancer agreed to the job. During the stealth portion of the tutorial mission, the freelancer arrived at the police station and showed off their stealth capabilities. They also managed to steal the evidence file the police had on the Dawn Valley incident. For some reason, the freelancer actually knew about the Dawn Valley incident, showing admiration towards the operation, and said, That was a good hit, from what I hear. Fast. Clean. Professional. Ren noted this, and the freelancer successfully finished the mission without any troubles. Later that day, in the cutscene Halcyon, Ren and the director met in a meeting room, and Ren reflected on the Black Dawn incident. He was in utter disbelief that Jackdaw was still alive. He shot Jackdaw twice and dropped a burning building on him, referring to the events of Ember Shroud. Somehow, Jackdaw had managed to survive it? Impossible. Ren also informed the director that an operative at the scene, Rose, was still alive and was being held in a government black site called Wargate. The director ordered Ren to get her out of the prison and reminded him to finish the job if he was ever given the opportunity to kill Jackdaw again. Ren also asked the director whether or not he should take out the freelancer, to which the director suggests adding them to their ranks in the organization. The cutscene transitioned to the freelancer on a call with Ren, where they agreed to join the organization. They asked Ren what the organization was called, and he replied, Halcyon. On February 19th, the freelancer was sent on their first playable mission as a Halcyon agent, which was to break into the government black site Wargate and free Rose from her captivity. It's probably worth mentioning now that Sashado has confirmed that there is no canonical playstyle for the entire game. As much as I want stealth to be the canonical playstyle, stealth or loud really doesn't make a difference in the grand scheme of the story. Unofficial's video on breaking the fourth wall on entry point does a really good job of explaining this, so I'll leave it to him. Anyways, as the freelancer worked their way through the military prison, they were able to find and free Rose, handing her their unique custom raven. The mission was a resounding success. If the freelancer went stealth, they were able to authorize a helicopter prison transfer request by using the commander's access code, letting them easily fly away in a helicopter. If they went loud, they simply destroyed the anti-air turrets on the base and escaped with a helicopter as well. We're also introduced to Falcon in this mission as a pilot for Halcyon, though he doesn't really say anything. Rose returned to Halcyon and met with the director a couple days later, on February 21st. She was shocked to hear that Jackdaw was still alive and gave a similar reaction that Ren gave. She chose to blame Ren. She said that Ren shot Jackdaw, and told the director that she wanted a chance to kill him this time, because Ren clearly failed. Outside of the meeting room, Ren and the freelancer were talking. Rose joined in to inform them that she'd been promoted to mission coordinator, and that she would be acting as the freelancer's squad's new mission coordinator. Following the re-edition of Rose and Halcyon's ranks, a lot of bad events take place for the Canadian organization. These can be found in the financer file Internal Report Phoenix. On March 8th, a team of operatives vanished after an operation in Cairo, and on March 22nd, a Halcyon safe house was bombed in Paris. On April 13th, a courier for Halcyon disappeared near Montreal that had intel on the operatives in the area. Following this, on May 1st, a Halcyon operation team disappeared pre-operation, leading to the Shadow War map Montreal. Yes, Shadow War is a canonical part of Entry Point's story. Small events like these kept happening throughout 2012. On July 21st, a Halcyon jet carrying multiple operatives crashed in the ocean, and Halcyon suspected sabotage. On August 1st, Halcyon successfully identified three operatives that were planning to defect to an enemy organization, but were unable to provide intel on the organization before being eliminated. Following these events, the freelancer was contacted to steal stolen jewels from an American crime syndicate for an influential client in the Night Heist mission, The Auction. These jewels were in a bank in San Francisco, a money laundering organization for Halcyon, so the operation required absolute secrecy and couldn't be investigated by the local police. Don't worry, it only adds to the long list of reasons why stealth is objectively the better mode. The list of enemy organization activities continued, as on October 3rd, hackers infiltrated Halcyon's network and stole unknown amounts of information. This event will be important, so remember it for later. On December 24th, multiple Halcyon operative teams disappeared from around the globe in a coordinated strike. These were also Shadow War maps, being Calais, Swansea, and Woodford. 2012 was about to end, but before then, I'd like to mention a few events that don't have an exact date. First, the S97 stopped being produced by the Siegel Arms Company. It had a good life while it lasted, but the meta has moved on. Probably. I don't know, I don't play Shadow War. Additionally, Rose revived the Cicada program in 2012. The program was a way for Halcyon to find new members to join the organization, 
but is also a really cool way to tie house in with events in the real world. The Cicada program is a reference to Cicada 3301, a public code-breaking event that started on January 4th, 2012, and was worked on through 4chan. Anyways, the string of enemy organization activities continued in 2013, leading to teens betraying Halcyon in an arms deal in Washington on February 12th. On March 16th, another night heist occurred. The training mission, The Gala, was created in a brand new training facility to test out the Freelancer's squad's stealth capabilities. The goal of the mission was to steal artifacts from a simulated art gallery. We're not going to go over the fact that these artifacts look like super glued two-dimensional Jenga towers with wooden planks, but hey, Ren worked hard on them. We are going to go over the fact that the people in the simulated art gallery are probably actual Halcyon operatives, which means the Freelancer is shooting actual Halcyon operatives in this mission. Oh, and don't use that lame excuse, they're rubber bullets, because they aren't. Regardless, the enemy organization kept attacking Halcyon throughout 2013, albeit much less than 2012. On April 6th, the Halcyon facility was bombed. On May 29th, a Halcyon team in Lubin, Poland, disappeared. On September 4th, there were actual assassination attempts on Rose and Wren in Seattle. I'm surprised this was never brought up later in the game. On December 11th, Best Girl, I mean Sparrow, went missing in the US as a former member of the US Air Force. Remember that one hack back in 2012 that I told you to remember about? Well, they tried to hack Halcyon again, but this time, Halcyon was ready. On February 21st, the hackers failed to get a foothold on the Halcyon network, and Halcyon was finally able to track the hackers to a warehouse in New Jersey. This was the Shadow War map, Cape May. Finally, on March 2nd, the next base game mission was playable, The Financer. Both of the warehouses that were used by the hackers were leased by a man named Ryan Ross, and he was identified as a financial backer for the enemy organization. Halcyon wanted to investigate him, so the freelancer was sent to his penthouse, where they worked to steal a hard drive, and successfully captured or eliminated Ryan Ross. On March 8th, probably after questioning Ryan Ross a bit if he was still alive, or by scanning his hard drive, Halcyon finally realized that Jackal had built a full-fledged criminal organization to fight against them. He's created a network of spies and operatives all around the globe to fight them. On June 21st, 2014, the cutscene Ashes occurred. The freelancer showed up in San Diego, probably for an operation of some sort. Sadly, Rose was unable to make it to the operation, for unknown reasons. After hanging up the phone with her, Jackdaw appeared behind the Freelancer, with a gun pointed to his head. He told them to relay a message to the director. Jackdaw hadn't forgotten the event's member Shroud, and that Phoenix was coming for them. The Freelancer made a witty joke, and Jackdaw gave them some advice. He told them that he used to be just like them, doing all the dirty work for the director. This is another reference to Ember Shroud, as Jackdaw told the Freelancer to get out of the organization before the director used and betrayed them just like when he betrayed Jackdaw. Finally, the Shadow War had formally begun with two sides. The director's organization, Halcyon, where operatives were still under the impression that Jackdaw had killed the other directors of his own accord. The director needed the Project Onyx files back, and was going to stop at nothing until they were back in Halcyon's hands and Jackdaw was dead. Jackdaw's organization, Phoenix, was fueled by his revenge against the director for using him to kill the other directors and betraying him during the events of Ember Shroud. He was going to stop at nothing until the director, and Halcyon were dead. This Shadow War was going to end one way or another. The story continued on April 17, 2015, where a Phoenix stash was located in a bank in Cincinnati, Ohio. Almost a whole year passed since the events of Ashes, meaning that multiple operations probably happened along the way to reach this position. This led to a bond of friendship to be created between Rose and the Freelancer. Remember this for later. Regardless, in the mission The Deposit, the freelancer snuck into a bank called Cincinnati Trust and stole a stash, and probably some bags of money along the way. A few days later, on April 20th, in the cutscene Critical, Ren told the freelancer to relay a message to Rose that there was a critical mission that the squad had to do. It was time to find the Project Onyx files. The freelancer approached Rose in the shooting range and told her it was time to prepare for the operation. Rose started warming up to the freelancer, asking about their custom-built raven, even going so far as to tell them her real name, which is Rachel. The following day, the operation happened. In the mission The Lake House, the freelancer infiltrated a Phoenix safe house, disguised as a holiday house near a lake in Michigan. Though something's not right. Midway through the operation, a convoy started to approach the base, rushing the operation and forcing the freelancer to quickly hack the servers and steal one, or all of them. The mission was a success, regardless of whether or not the freelancer was able to escape without being detected. The convoy was Steel Cove as opposed to Phoenix, meaning that the government had planned to raid at the same time as Halcyon's mission. Following the events of the lake house, on May 16th, the cutscene dedication occurred. Ren and the freelancer were standing in a forest near Crown Lake, where Ren started to open up to the freelancer, 
talking about his backstory in Jackdaw. In a dramatic turn of events, he told them that they had betrayed Halcyon, and that they needed to be eliminated. He caught them. He always catches them. Ren temporarily disabled them on the ground, confident he'd won, as most villains do. Right before he was able to finish the job, however, Jackdaw showed up and saved the Freelancer by shooting Ren. The Freelancer, having nowhere else to go and no one else to work with, eventually ended up working with Jackdaw and Phoenix. While it's unclear exactly how this deal came into fruition, I think it's best to leave it to imagination. Jackdaw's first mission for them, on July 17th, 2015, in the mission The Withdrawal, was to steal money from Halcyon at a bank that laundered money for them. This bank was the same one that the Freelancer had retrieved the jewel from in the auction. Throughout this mission, Jackdaw seemed cold, harsh, and untrusting of the Freelancer. He didn't quite know the Freelancer well enough to open up to them. Regardless, on July 21st, a few days after the withdrawal mission, the cutscene Retribution occurred. Jackdaw met with the Freelancer in a cabin out in the wilderness. The Freelancer expressed attachment to Rose, and asked Jackdaw if they could reach out to her. They had done many operations for her in the past, and wanted to talk to her again, believing that she'd be a great help to the Freelancer and Phoenix. She trusted them. Jackdaw, however, revealed something to the Freelancer, and by extension, to the player. Rose was dead. She had been working for Phoenix as an informant all this time, and Halcyon found out following the events of the lake house. This reveal meant a lot for the story, so I'd like to go back and explain a few things that may have seemed unexplainable. When Jackdaw survived Ember Shroud, Rose was there. After the director revealed to Jackdaw's squad that Jackdaw had killed the other directors, she didn't morally believe that it was right to kill Jackdaw. So, during the events of Ember Shroud and the planned assassination of Jackdaw, she saved him. It's unknown how she managed to save Jackdaw after he got shot twice with a burning building dropped on him, though again, I think that's best left to imagination. After saving Jackdaw, something changed in him. He no longer had any moral motivations. He was solely hell-bent on carrying out his revenge against Halcyon and the director. Rose tried to let him go into hiding, and she felt it was morally correct to let him go away, but Jackdaw had different plans. He told her that he wanted her to act as a double agent for him. Following this event, Rose constantly told Jackdaw of what Halcyon was planning, up until the events of Black Dawn. Jackdaw knew Black Dawn was going to happen. He knew exactly where and when it would happen, because Rose was his insider from the start. He shot a thumper at the van, killing two operatives and sparing Rose. He had to make it look realistic, so he shot her twice, similarly to how he was shot twice in Ember Shroud. We have no idea what the extent of Rose's dealings with Jackdaw were past this point, at least until Ashes, but we can assume that throughout this time, Rose was informing Jackdaw about missions and operation teams that were being sabotaged throughout 2012 through 2014. So, during the cutscene Ashes, Rose was talking to the Freelancer, and she told him that she couldn't make it to San Diego. She knew very well that Jackdaw was going to show up, and planned it to work out that way. After the deposit, Rose looked through the information that the Freelancer had taken from the Phoenix stash, and realized that the stash contained intel on the Phoenix safe house with Project Onyx files. Throughout the Shadow War, she realized that she didn't want to be a part of it anymore. She originally joined Phoenix to make things right, attacking Halcyon for moral reasons. After all, she was just an ordinary hacker born from a rich family in Monaco. She didn't want to kill people and destroy facilities just for money. However, as the tables turned, she realized that Jackdaw was only doing this for revenge. She desperately didn't want the files in either side's hands, as shown in the Rose personnel file, so she decided to call Steel Cove in an attempt to get the files in the government's hands. The director noticed how she didn't call Phoenix. Jackdaw didn't even know that Steel Cove or Halcyon were going to raid the Lake House when the mission happened. Throughout the Lake House mission, Rose tried to stall and sabotage in an attempt to prevent Halcyon from getting their hands on the files. But the Freelancer was too good. They finished the mission, either faster than Steel Cove could arrive, or destroyed the Steel Cove convoy in the process. With the Project Onyx files in Halcyon's hands, they were able to investigate the odd occurrence of Steel Cove showing up during the time of the mission, and why there were so many Halcyon files in the Phoenix servers. They discovered that Rose had tipped off Steel Cove, letting them know of the operation in an attempt to prevent either side from getting the files. Further investigation revealed that Rose was working for Phoenix the whole time, so Halcyon chose to eliminate both her and her squad, which included the Freelancer, for safety. Rose was killed near Lake Erie, but not before she was able to get out one last phone call to Jackdaw. She informed him of dedication before it happened, 
and saved the freelancer's life. She trusted the freelancer, and the bond between them was strong. Their connection is likely what led to Jackdaw saving them in the first place. Anyways, back to Retribution. As Jackdaw revealed the fact that Rose was a double agent, and that she died, he showed the freelancer a memorial for her, by the river nearby. The freelancer, clearly disturbed by the sudden reveal of her death, felt the need to blame Jackdaw for her death, saying he got her killed. Jackdaw responded by stating that it was ultimately Halcyon's fault, and that they needed to destroy the people responsible. This created the freelancer's motive to destroy Halcyon, for killing their best friend, Rose. It's worth remembering that before this, the freelancer's only friend had betrayed them for $20 million, so they don't have much experience dealing with the loss of a great friend. To lose the only person they held dear meant a big deal to them. So yeah, revenge time. On September 19th, the final night heist, The Cash, happened. After the death of Ryan Ross, a lot of money was lost, causing a major source of money to go missing for Phoenix. Jackdaw wanted the money from Ryan Ross's offshore accounts to be given back to Phoenix, so he ordered the freelancer to infiltrate the Cincinnati Trust Bank and authorize a money transfer to Phoenix. Nothing really happened throughout 2016, or at least that we know of. There were two major events, however, that happened towards the end of the year. The first was an assassination attempt on Sparrow on September 8th. We don't really know what happened here, except for the fact that she was in her helicopter when the assassination attempt happened. The second event was a scientist mission on Christmas Eve 2016. Another Halcyon member wanted to defect to Phoenix. Her name was Rivera, and she wanted to provide intel to Phoenix, but was stuck in a remote safe house in London, Ontario. Halcyon originally hired her to research the Project Onyx files, but she defected regardless. Maybe she didn't believe it was right to research the files, and one of them gone, just like Rose did. The freelancer had to break her out of the house, with force or stealthily, by eliminating all the operatives, including Operative Falcon, that were residing there. The mission was a success, with either Rivera escaping on Sparrow's helicopter, or the intel having been taken from Falcon's USB. Finally, the year 2017 came. This year was the end of Entry Point Story, at least for now. It started off with payoff on New Year's Day. Jackdaw approached the freelancer in an old shed, startling them. He told them about how the end was coming and how he couldn't wait. When Tachado originally released this cutscene on March 3rd, 2019, it was the first cutscene to confirm that the freelancer had started working with Jackdaw, which was a huge shock to the entry point community at the time. On March 12th, 2017, the mission The SCRS happened. In the mission, the freelancer had to infiltrate the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, hidden behind a travel agency, to find the plans they had sold to Halcyon for a secret bunker. The mission was a success, and the freelancer escaped the facility with the plans for the Halcyon Bunker. Personally, this mission's my favorite. A month later, on April 13th, the cutscene Jackdaw occurred. This cutscene was the second to last cutscene, and revealed a lot to the freelancer. The cutscene opened with Jackdaw and the freelancer in the back of a truck, reminiscing on the events that have happened that led them to this moment. The freelancer asked about how Rose joined Phoenix, and Jackdaw informed them about how Rose helped found Phoenix, for moral reasons. When the freelancer asked about Jackdaw's motivations, he only responded by expressing his motivation for revenge. He didn't care about the Shadow War, he didn't care about who came out on top. The only thing he cared about was that he at least died trying to take down the Director. Jackdaw knew that the satisfaction it would bring would be short term, and that it ultimately wouldn't bring him any closer to peace. He knew what he was bringing himself to do, and he wasn't going to stop until it was done. It's worth noting the design choice that Tishado tried to go for here. During the cutscene Ashes, Jackdaw revealed his name and organization, Jackdaw and Phoenix, respectively. During the cutscene Jackdaw, he talked about how his revenge would only bring about Ashes. I thought this connection between the two cutscenes was pretty interesting, and not well known. It sort of feels like a completion of some sort. Speaking of completions, on April 16th, 2017, exactly a decade after the cutscene prelude from the freelance heists, the mission Black Dusk happened. This was it. All of the conflict led up to this moment. All around the globe, strings of coordinated attacks and bombings on Halcyon's bases and safe houses were leading to the destruction of the organization. The Freelancer's mission wasn't any different. They geared up to destroy one of Halcyon's main bunkers, the one whose plan was found during the SCRS mission in the months prior. They prepared to destroy the facility, planting bombs throughout the bunker without radio contact with Jackdaw on the outside. They successfully planted all the bombs and attempted to escape the facility using the elevator they had arrived in, but it shut down. They were trapped. There wasn't enough time to override the elevator controls. It was over. The mission was complete. Jackdaw approached the director, ready to end it all. 
the entire story, the deaths of all the beloved characters had led to this moment. He picked up a raven and shot it through the director's heart. It was over. And yet, it wasn't quite over. What are question mark, question mark, question mark, and the kill house? Are they some kind of dream? Some afterlife limbo? Maybe. During both missions, the freelancer was dead, and yet, they seemed to be in a dreamlike state. In this dream, they revisited places in their memories. In the mission question mark question mark question mark from the 2020 Halloween hit list, they could hear Jackdaw's voice, sorrowful yet proud. He was happy it was over, exactly as he wanted. These were the words that Jackdaw would have said at the freelancer's grave. The Kill House is similar, yet a bit different. In the freelancer's dreams, their memories are inconsistent with reality, even in the slightest way. If you've ever watched Inception, you may find this topic to be familiar. The thin wooden planks scattered throughout the Kill House on the floor are in different places than they are in the Gala mission. This minute detail was intentional, as it attempted to highlight how the Kill House was in this sort of dreamlike state. During the nightmare mode, the freelancer could hear Rose's voice, disappointed by the outcome of the Shadow War. This... isn't right. It's not what should have happened. It's done. It's over. Had to have your revenge, didn't you? Couldn't just walk away. I wish it hadn't ended like this. You had to know this is where it would take you. Au revoir. Rose never wanted all this conflict. She gave Jackdaw an option to leave from the start, and he didn't take it. She tried to prevent the freelancer from joining Phoenix, but Jackdaw still invited them to the organization. And yet, how did that work out? Entry Point's story isn't meant to be satisfying. It doesn't have a climactic conclusion, complete with explosions and bad guys dying, because in reality, that's not what this story is about. It's about betrayal loss, and most of all, revenge. Jackdaw knew what he was doing when he started the Shadow War, and as a result, Phoenix got what they wanted. Was it worth it? Did they really make a difference?
Super Luigi. 